Packing irregular objects tightly on a surface is one of those always popular topics and one that you'll most likely encounter in your career. And as usual with these kind of topics, there are multiple ways of solving them. Our favorite being using some sort of physics simulation to pack the object, which Manuel already did using RBDs when packing a torus. However, in some instances, RBDs might not be my favorite way of doing this, as nowadays vellum provides a unified framework that, while not being absolutely rigid, providing enough rigidity to solve those RBD-ish simulation problems while maintaining interoperability with, for example, soft body simulations or fluid simulations. Also, by choosing how we create those pieces of geometry that we want to pack and how to orient them, we can slightly art direct them to, for example, create those kind of images that remind me of a stone garden. To set this up in Houdini, as always, I'm going to drop down a geo node, dive in there, and in here, the first thing I want to create is a grid. And in this grid, I want to increase its resolution from 10 by 10 rows and columns to maybe 100 by 100 rows and columns, because I want to use those individual points that we create where those rows and columns intersect to store a density attribute. To later tell a scatter node how dense we want to scatter points in here. Also, I want to draw a few curves to drive the orientation and the distribution of my objects that I want to pack and scatter on here. I'm going to do that using a draw curve node making sure it's highlighted, setting the projection to be along the ZX plane here, and then making sure the tool handle is selected and drawing a few curves in here. For example, let's start off easy-ish, maybe something like this. And now you clearly can see why I chose computer graphics over a career as an illustrator. Let's smooth those curves out a bit by using an Atrap Blur node, which will set up to not pin the border points here and increasing our blurring iterations quite substantially to maybe 15, which didn't help much, but it's better than nothing. And then to this, let's attach a resample, which will set up to generate a subdivision curve here, smoothing this out a further bit. And maybe let's highlight points here and maybe increase point spacing a bit. And maybe let's move that after blur after the resample node to blur this out even further. And yeah, that is more like it. All right, let's again resample this because now after the blur, we have mingled with the point spacing in here. So another resample down here, set to a length of 0.1, that's fine. Make sure that in the resample, we also check the tangent U attribute. Let's just visualize what we're doing here by going to this information icon here and then clicking on the tangent U to create a visualizer for that. And then in the visualizers settings here, right click in here and adjust the tangent U visualizer to be a marker and a vector. And you can see here the tangents just point from one point to the next. Those are those vectors. And we're gonna use them to orient our copies, which we're gonna instance in a second. All right, let's take this grid on the one side and on the other side, let's just auto lay out those here by pressing down A and then drawing upwards. And then using a point vop, which we're gonna to use to write a bit of data onto our grid's points here. And we're gonna derive this data from our resampled curve here. Namely in here, what we wanna create is a density and we want to create less dense areas where these resampled curves are and denser areas where the resampled curves are not. We can do that by going to the point vop and in here dropping down a near point and from our current points position, which is each point of this grid here. So P goes into the position. We wanna look up a close point that's on those resampled curves. That means the curve's coming in through our second input slot like this here. And then I wanna use this nearest point on our curve to look up its position using an import point attribute. So the point number of that near point that is coming into that second input slot that goes into the file here, which will result in a vector of three returning the points position. So we now looked up for each of those points here, forming the grid, the closest point on any given curve that's coming into the second input slot, and then this closest points position. So now let's get the distance between the grid's point position and the point on the curve that's closest to a certain grid point position. And finally, write out this distance using a bind export and export this to an attribute called density. So that's what we built here. Let's just head up one level and set the view flag on the point vop. Let's disable this here. And again, going to the information menu here, let's click on the density and we can see for each point of our grid, we see a visualization of the distance towards the closest point on these two incoming curves that I drew. And I wanna use this information to drive how we distribute, how we scatter. In our case, a few boxes, which we're then gonna pack. So after this point vault, I'm gonna use a scatter node. And in here, I wanna scatter by density using a density attribute like this. Let's uncheck the visualizer here so we can see 
But now in those areas that are closer to those lines I drew, we are getting a less dense point distribution. To make this distribution even more uniform, let's just scroll down here and increase the relaxation iterations to a rather high value of 256, which takes a while to compute, but then spits out this here. In our scatter node also, let's go to the output attributes. And in here, let's check output radius attribute, P scale, which will automatically calculate a point scale or an instant scale for each point that is dependent on the distance to the nearest point. We could already feel tempted to drop down a box and a copy to point and then wire in our box in the first and our scatter node in the second slot and highlight this. And we can already see that we are getting a distribution of boxes of cubes of different sizes, which is what we expect. For later, for simulation purposes, I want to increase the axis divisions to five along each axis like this. But I promised you that we'd also use those curves that we drew to orient those boxes, which we clearly didn't yet. So let's take care of that by selecting the box and the copy to points and then dragging this down here because we're going to add a few nodes in between the scatter and the copy to points here. The first being an attrib transfer. The scatter goes in the first and the resample node up here in the second slot. And I want to set this attrib transfer up to transfer the point attribute only and the one that's called tangent u. So now if we highlight our visualizer, we can see that we are getting those stroke directions on those points. However, if I just straight up wire this into the copy to points like this and disable our visualizer, we can see the copy to points still isn't orienting those boxes along the tangent u. That is because copy to points is set up by default to either look up for a normal and an up vector, for an orientation attribute, or even for a transformation matrix to orient those copies. So what we're gonna do here is just using an attribute rename to rename our tangent u attribute, tangent u attribute to n, capital N for our normal. And now we can see that those boxes are now oriented along the tangent u. Just for good measure, we could add an attribute create and create an up attribute, which should be a vector. And let's have it point along the y axis. So not much change here. However, we could now use this to further orient our boxes like this, for example. Just gonna reset this to zero, one, zero, like so. And now we're good to go to work with those individual copies here. And here, it's important that we leave pack and instance unchecked because for this workflow, we're gonna need solid geometry copies here. And the first node I wanna wire in after the copy to points after we created this geometry here is a connectivity node. What this one does is for each point on one connected piece of geometry, so for each point on each single box here, we're gonna store an attribute which is called class and which will have the same number in it if all those points are on the same box. It's just a fancy way of telling Houdini and downstream nodes which points belong to which boxes. All right, let's set up the simulation. It's rather straightforward in our case using just a vellum constraint. Connectivity goes into the first slot in here. And on the vellum constraint node here, I wanna set this up to be a shape match constraint type. And just to see what this does, let's wire a null into the pink slot here. That's where the constraints are being created in here. So we can see that for each connected piece of geometry, that means for each box here, we are creating one single primitive here, a line connecting all those points, storing a few attributes in here. Namely, we're interested in the points rest position, which is each point's original position in here. And now if we want to expand those individual geometries, those individual boxes here, in order to pack this surface, we'll also have to update this rest position here in the constraints points. Let's go through this step by step by attaching a vellum solver after our vellum constraint. And when I built the setup, I set up the substeps to two and the constraint iteration to 64, which gave me decent results. The rest in here I left as is. And in the forces tab, I disabled gravity, setting it to all zero. I disabled the wind, had no velocity damping and left everything as is. In the simulation, one thing you can do if you have the RAM to spare, increase the cache memory so you can cache the whole timeline. And I think that's it for now. So what I wanna do here is I now want to scale up those individual boxes so they pack each other tightly. And for this workflow, I don't wanna use a rest length scaling in the Valve Solver, but I wanna use this geometry up here, the box that we pipe into the copy to points and wanna drive its uniform scale directly. And you could either keyframe this by alt clicking in here, setting a keyframe, then going to 
the respective position in your timeline and increasing this to some value that you want. For example, two and again, alt clicking in here. However, in my case, I'm gonna undo this because what I wanna do is use a small expression. So I wanna start with a uniform scale of one and then increase this using our current frame count. So $FF. However, on the first frame, I want my frame count to be zero. So I have to subtract one and then to make it scale up slower, multiply this by a small factor, I don't know, 0 0.05, like this. So this should now, if I highlight it, or maybe highlight the copy to points and hit play, it smoothly scales up. However, it intersect each other. So let's reset that and highlight our Velm solver. And even in here, if we hit play now, we can see this thing takes a bit to simulate. However, this animation that we set up is not transported into our simulation. We have to take care of this manually. So let's do that. We're gonna do that by diving into our Velm solver here and inside this solver here, into the forces tab here, we're gonna wire in a geometry wrangle in which we're gonna write two lines of vex, two very simple lines of vex. The not so simple part is setting this geo wrangle up in a way that we want. We want this geo wrangle to work on the constraint geometry. And we can tell Houdini to do so by getting to the data bindings tab here. And by default, this is bound to work on our simulation geometry. To have this work on our constraint geometry, what we have to do is type in constraint geometry, capital C, capital G. And also for our inputs in here, I want to have the first input set to myself, no reads of output, so we can work on the constraint geometry. The second input to be dot data, that is the dollar obj id forward slash geometry. So if we need to access the simulation geometry, that is what we're seeing here for some reason, we can do that through input slot two, that's the one with the id one. And then finally, finally, I wanna go up here and use this geometry here that's coming in after the connectivity, the geometry that scales up to read in those individual points positions. To do this, I'll attach a null to the connectivity and let's call this one out underscore anim for out underscore animation and go back into our Vellum solver. And in our geometry wrangle, let's set up our input three to look up data coming in through a certain SOP. And the SOP, that means the node that we are looking up this data from is, you guessed it, the out underscore animation. So now we're finally set up to write those two very simple lines of VEX. Let's do so. In the first line, I just wanna look up each point's scale up position from, let's go up one level, this node here, the out underscore anim. So I wanna look up what's happening here with the point positions here. Can do that by going into the Vellum solver and then the geometry wrangle, just creating a vector, let's call it rest vec for rest vector, and it should be equal to the points position data, which comes in through our third input slot, input slot with the ID two, and we're gonna look up the points position and as the point numbers don't change, and it's important that the point numbers don't change for this kind of setup, we can just use the PT num here. And then all I wanna do is write out this newly read in position onto our rest position. So V at rest, remember that's what we looked up on this constraint geometry previously, equals to the rest back we just looked up like so. All right, let's go up one level, save this, keep our fingers crossed, maybe check real time toggle and let's simulate this. And we're seeing a simulation that's mostly working. I think we're seeing some intersections here. Let me just reset the viewport and refresh it maybe to get rid of any eventual viewport errors, which we can do by going to help and then checking reset viewport. Now you can see those intersections are gone. So let's replay this animation here. And you can see that now we are rapidly displacing and pushing apart those individual geometries. On some occasions, we are seeing that this geometry is not totally rigid. Vellum is doing its best that it can to provide a rigid as possible geometry here. However, if we want to generate absolutely rigid geometry, let's just use this simulated geometry, extract its transforms, and then write that back onto our original undistorted geometry here, which we can do by using an extract transform to extract the transforms between our original geometry and our transform geometry like this. Let's just set its piece attribute to class and the attribute class to point. And we wanna extract the translation, rotation, and uniform scale, leaving us with these template points storing exactly this translation, rotation, and scale. And now we can use the transform pieces node with the connectivity wired into the first and the extract transform into the second slot. Let's just highlight this here, set the match by attribute to match by class. And that is it, totally rigid geometry that is behaving as we'd expect. Maybe this could use a bit of damping in a simulation. Maybe we could attach a few constraints that try keeping the individual geometry pieces on their original place. However, this is the basic technique that I'm using when packing 
surfaces in vellum. Again, why would you want to do this? A is rather quick. Apart from this a bit awkward setup here with the geometry wrangle, which again is only two lines of code and admittedly you could even write this into one line. The worst thing about this is setting up the data bindings and the input. Apart from this, it's rather quick and also, as mentioned, Vellum is a unified framework that not only allows you to solve this kind of rigid-ish body dynamics, but also soft bodies and fluids and also grains and thus particles. So if you're looking for a unified framework that allows you to quickly iterate on those small scale setups, I highly encourage you to give this a try. All right, I'll take this, turn this into an artwork for this tutorial. And if you want to learn more about Houdini, Unreal, generative design, or just plainly want to support us, consider becoming a patron of ours. And to everyone out there supporting us already, thanks so much, folks. It's through your help that we are able to run in Tagma. With a very special thank you going out to important looking pirates, jellyfish pictures, the mill, electric theater, Pixonic, Random42, Rodeo FX, Side FX, Lusion, and Rafika Nadol Studio. Thanks so much for supporting us. So, as always, intrigued to see what you folks cook up. And until next time, it is cheers and goodbye.